Welcome back. I'm Ryan, and today on the Tiny Podcast special bicentennial episode, I have two historians with us, Walter Woodward and Susan Barlow. Welcome, guys. How you Hi, doing? How you doing, Ryan? Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Oh, this is great. You only, you only have one bicentennial. <laughs> Glad you got that joke in there. That's there good. There you go. That's good. So what I wanted to talk today about the beginning of Manchester. I feel like that's a pretty good place to start. We're going to do another episode on before Manchester, but maybe that's a good place for us to start the conversation, kind of that transition, you know, between when, you know, there was the indigenous people that were here before and now what we, you know, our European settlers or so. What, how did that look? Did, Susan, how, how did that transition maybe look back then? The Native Americans were here 10,000 mm. years ago. So when we talk about Manchester's bicentennial, 1823, it's like quite recent compared to um, that time. Also, mm. in the 1600s, Thomas Hooker coming down from Massachusetts, that's when people started to settle in the Manchester area. And it, it's such a pleasure to work with Walter Woodward because he's got the Connecticut history and I'm a little bit more on the Manchester side <clears throat> but also that when you're studying Manchester or you're studying Connecticut you're studying American history mm. it's a mic it can be a microcosm of how we came from a sawmill on a river the Harkonnen River to more and more industry along the river t to farming that eventually um, gave way to industry but mm. Studying the smaller, you get a sense of the larger, don't you? I'm, I am the. I was. St I retired as state historian last year, but I was state historian for 18 years. Mm. And the thing I became absolutely convinced of is that history is more real, that you feel a stronger connection to it, and it makes more sense when you study the history that happened around you rather than the history that happened in far and distant places. And everything that's happened in American history had an impact here. People lived their lives. Any event that you can think of had ramifications for Manchester. Mm -hmm. So it, I completely agree with you. you if you want to study American history, start close to home mm -hmm. because it will mean more and be more powerful. That's a really good point. Mm -hmm. I, that's, uh, that's a very interesting way of thinking about that. And in, in Connecticut, we're really lucky because we were, the, we're one of the 13 original colonies. We were settled in 1635, which is right at the beginning of the American experiment. When I say settled, of course, and Susan made that really clear, th that settlement by Europeans was not the first settlement of this region. And it's, if I were a Native American sitting here right now, mm -hmm. I would be thinking, and I'm sure there are Native Americans, indigenous people listening to this podcast who will think, boy, they're making a big deal out of 200 years. That's <laughs> one-fifth of 1,000 years, and indigenous people have been mm -hmm. here for maybe 12,000 years. Yeah. So, so the... The time scale is different. The sense of history is different. But having said that, let me say that a tremendous amount has happened both in America and Manchester in two centuries, and it is great to have a chance to focus on that at the time of a big anniversary. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, well said. And you can look at it throughout Connecticut. Some of the patterns, the New England patterns, really not just Connecticut, but you'd have a town like the Brass City or the Silver City, Meriden. But in Manchester, it was a little bit different because mm. we did have cotton mills going back into the 18th century and woolen mills, paper, silk. It was a wide variety mm. of businesses and, and never a company town, so to speak, where you, know, you have a sense of the employees are really being abused mm. because the big mill owners could set all the rules. Mm. Let's d let's talk about that too. So we you know we, we're getting to the mills, and I know that that's a big part of Manchester's history. What was 
what what were people doing before the mills? Was it mainly agriculture? You know, because you know we're talking about you know mills need you know things to mill. So did that was it mainly al- kind of where it started with agriculture, and then people kind of just moved into that, or how did that go? Well, it was it it was standard in New England mm-hmm. when Europeans arrived, and this is in the days before the Industrial Revolution. They they needed two things as a prerequisite to really establishing any permanent settlement. Okay. They needed a sawmill and they needed a grist mill. Mm -hmm. You had to be able to turn logs into wood to build houses, and it was an extremely laborious process to do it by hand. Mm. So having a sawmill was the great labor-saving device of the 17th and 18th centuries, and having a grist mill did for the food you ate every day, what the sawmill did for wood, it so simplified and speeded up the pace of grinding grain. Mm. And and maize was, from the beginning, an essential food to English settlers. Mm-hmm. So having, having a grist mill to grind corn, to grind grain, having a sawmill were essential. When people settled Hartford, the... Thomas Hooker's people in 1635 and 6. The date people usually accept is 1636. People were here the year before Mm -hmm. scouting it out. But what they did is they settled on one side of the river, but they very quickly saw that the land on both sides of the riverbank was fertile, good land. So pretty soon they were canoeing across or flat boating across or barging across. They were crossing the river to get to land on the other side. And over the first four decades of settlement, these English settlers gradually spread out from the riverbanks. Mm. And what was it, 1670? The first uh, sawmill in Manchester was 1672 as documented. There you go. Yeah. So. Mm. And it was the Hockenham River, right? That well, I th- I'm looking here. It says Bigelow, which runs okay. into the Hockenham. Sure. Just Th- in that Hilliardville area. Now, is Bigelow a stream or a creek? or? W- it depends. <laughs> it depends <laughs> on that. But right now, I would say it's more like a small river. Mm-hmm. Well, in, in 1673, it had just the right water speed, and, and mm. you know, it had the right features that it made sense to someone that we, if we put – a mill here. Was it a sawmill or a grist mill? Sawmill. If we put a sawmill here, we will have the kind of water supply we need Mm. to be able to help people get the lumber they need for all the various things for which they use lumber. And that was the ubiquitous building of wood. Yeah. Okay. So so sawmills and grist mills then, that was kind of the start. That's like your starting point. for From an industrial standpoint, standpoint, the starting point was the land. Okay. The, these were the these initial settlers depended on agriculture as much as anything else. We were an agrarian colony mm. for the first hundred and fifty years of settlement. Yeah. D- agriculture dominated both the economy and people's lives, but these sawmills and grist mills kind of became the nodes of uh, what was a barter economy. Mm. Wasn't a lot of cash going around. So people, you would go and you would trade what you grew for the things that you needed. I I imagine at Manchester Historical Society, they probably have some of these early account books that – I know there are in the state archives and other mm. places. There are these these millers became merchants almost by default mm. because to grind your grain, mm-hmm. they would be paid with a percentage of the grain that they ground for you. Well, then they would use that. They would trade for people in other places. They'd collect goods, and then you would come to them and say, okay, I'll give you – Five bushels of corn. I'm making all of these Yeah, of course, up. right. Five bushels of corn for, you know, uh, uh, four ounces of sugar and 
a half a bottle of rum and mm. some flour. Yeah, yeah. Or whatever. But, and this was the way trade went on. Mm. And people lived, we think of credit cards now, and we being a credit card society, they were as often as dependent on credit in this period in a different mm. way. The merchant would keep an account book. There'd be a page with your name on it. You would come and you'd say, I'll give you this. I'm going to buy this. Or I'll take these goods and I'll give you stuff when it grows. I'll yeah, bring when, it when, my, when I when – So I, over yeah. a year, you would build a long list of credits and debits. Mm. When it came one, – once a year or whenever, the merchant would say, let's settle accounts. Maybe when the harvest came in and you were relatively flush – but this, we often think, when you look at the records, people seem to be, in this period, almost paranoid if somebody says something bad about them. They'll take you to court, they'll sue you. Mm. A lot of litigation over people sullying your reputation. Mm. And I used to wonder, you know, were these, were these people just, you know, quick to take offense? But I... I realize, at least I think this is true, that someone's reputation was absolutely indispensable to their credit mm. line. If you got a reputation of being an undependable person, uh, a, a, a mean person, someone who didn't live up to their promises, your credit line gets cut off and you are, you're in trouble. So reputation, mm. kind of credits through these merchants. You see the beginnings of the world we live in taking shape in very small ways mm. in this agricultural economy. Interesting. Does that make sense? Mm. Mm. Yeah. And sheep and cows and I forgot the sheep and cows. And That's <laughs> right. Yeah. I will give you a sheep if you give me <laughs> Oh, the I need thing clocks. Where could I get clocks? Oh, Susan? let's see. I think we could maybe <laughs> carve some wool. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. So we go from these these grist mills and these and these you know lumber mills, and we build the infrastructure. We build these settlements. Now we're getting closer to eighteen hundred. We're getting closer to you know we're getting closer to the start of Manchester. What was happening, you know, right – what was happening like right before, like, the birth of Manchester? Susan, maybe that's something you can speak on. You know, what was happening – you know, Manchester was established in 1823. Is that correct? As a separate town from East Hartford. As yes. a separate town from East Hartford. But okay. So when did that when – yeah. when, when, when did East Hartford – you know, when did that happen then? When was that connection? Well, it all had to do with the church. Okay. Because you had to go to church. Of course. The Congregational Church, the Puritan Church – was also the government. Oh, okay. And so well, and the, there was a reason behind this. It's the Puritans who settled Connecticut, that in the fundamental orders, the first written constitution, some people say, the fundamental orders of Connecticut in 1639, the people who found Connecticut say that their desire is to create a godly society. Mm. But they were Calvinists as well. And as Calvinists, they firmly believed that most people, that, that the basic component of human nature was that people were depraved. Mm. They weren't just naturally bad. They were naturally awful. Mm. <laughs> that their default position was to do the wrong thing. Oh, wow. And, and so they really did believe that God would choose just a few people for salvation. Mm. So they said, if you're going to form a godly society, you better have a moral regulator as the foundation for your town. Mm. So before you could start a town in Connecticut, you had to form a parish. And what that means is you had to get people together who would agree – that they were going to fund and pay for a minister, hmm. that they would tax themselves to support a minister and a church. And people had to pay taxes to support the church, mm -hmm. but you can imagine if you're supporting the church in a bigger town, mm -hmm. it takes a lot to go off and say, well, we 20 or 30 families, we're gonna go over here. 
and now it's it's much more convenient for us to set up our own church mm-hmm. than to drive, you know, to cross the river to get into Hartford right. to go back. To right. Church. So, so they set up these churches, mm. and the parish becomes the foundation, right? Exactly. And so it was 1773 that Orford Parish was established. That was East Hartford and Manchester. So you didn't have to go to Hartford, but your parish was uh, a combination of East Hartford and Manchester. And there were efforts to get Manchester incorporated as a separate town, but they didn't come to fruition until 1823. So our history goes back to East Hartford. We're kind of interesting uh, siblings, I guess. Or, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, a sister. Uh, was was the parish in Manchester hived off from the church in East Hartford? Was it yes. people who had been the members? This is the Connecticut pattern. Yeah. There is an existing church. The, the people, to get more land for their children, they're moving away from the center of the town. They get farther out. It is an inconvenience to come to church every Sunday, but you're required to do it. Mm. So it becomes both time and cost efficient, but also it's sort of a symbol of your independence when you can establish a church. Mm -hmm. So all over Connecticut, there is a mother church that hives off as people spread out sister churches Mm -hmm. or daughter churches. Right. See, we're getting, again, back to that theme of learn about Manchester or East Hartford, and you have a better sense of the history of the state. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, everybody's connected mm. and you know we're we're all in this together whether yeah. we like it or not yeah <laughs> yeah it's but true but even before 1823 we did talk about industry there was the pitkin glass works mm. that um they operated from 1783 to 1830 you've probably seen them over there at the corner of pitkin and uh, parker street okay looks yeah. like a ruined castle it's great it look it actually looks like a kind of a stone building or factory that just fell down and the ruins are still there yeah mm. yeah but and am i right that I, I i vaguely recall reading somewhere that pitkin who was one of these standing order you know the the elite family so it's not surprising he'd get the monopoly on glass production but that was given to him because he provided gunpowder during yeah. the american revolution mm. yeah so, so he was given a 25-year monopoly. So it's a, you know, this is a reward. People need glassware. Locally produced glassware has mm. got to be in high demand. Right. And he's got a 25-year monopoly on it. That was a big deal. The Pitkins were a very big deal mm. in East Hartford and Manchester. Have they done any digs on the site of the glassware? Yes. Works? UConn has come out a couple of times. And, and what do they find? Is oh, this yeah. They find parts of the crucible. They oh, find... Um, shards there's so many shards that they just like shovel them into buckets and That's tell amazing. the kids they can take them home yeah. <laughs> um, but if you find a real pitkin glass which had the kind of swirly lines on them i have a friend bought a prius when he sold one body wow they're really wow uh, collectors love them yeah well, and it you know it's amazing. This it, he starts this in 1783, right? Mm-hmm. So this is right as the American Revolution is ending. Yorktown is in 1781. The Treaty of Paris is in 1783. So you can see Pitkin himself is probably thinking, well, uh, you know, gunpowder is not going to be as good a business <laughs> as it has been. <laughs> what else am I going to do? And he. Yeah. At least for a couple years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. For twenty-five <laughs> years, there must be something else I can do. But that is—it's really interesting to me that this happens in. It, it was called Orford, then Orford right? Orford Parish. The, Orford yeah. Parish, right? That this business or this manufactory, manufactory, is started in Orford Parish, and am I right? Just about the same time. The Hilliard Mills began the yes, which also were the 1790s. I think the Hilliard Mills got started, and the Union Cotton Mills, which were over in the North End. Um, it did seem like almost all at once. It that? well, what it must have seemed like agony to them <laughs> to like really well, go out of their way to even to build 
a glass work. Like what, that. Is, what is interesting to me is that all around Connecticut, people are beginning to think about manufacturing as the new economy. And the reason they're doing this is because after a century and a half of farming Connecticut land, they didn't have fertilizers. They didn't have Scots, and mm. they didn't have Miracle Grow. Right. You, you and they, m- many of them didn't collect manure to use as fertilizer either. The land was simply tapped out in a lot of places. Yeah. It was, and at the same time, the average Connecticut family had eight children. As those children grew up, it was an expectation that you are going that you as the godly parents are going to help them get established on their own. Mm. Uh, usually, that's with land so that they can farm too. By 1750, 1770, there's no more land to give away. Right. The land that you have is tapped out. People start leaving Connecticut. During this same period, they begin out migration in droves. It starts as a trickle after the revolution as people who went through Vermont and northern New England during the French and Indian War and the Revolutionary War, they thought, wow, that's beautiful country up there. We'll go, yeah. you know, we'll go set up there. They moved to Vermont, and usually a winter was about enough for them sometimes, yeah. too. <laughs> <laughs> Me, too. And then they started going west, and you know, they moved to what is still called the Western Reserve of Ohio. Mm. It was a part of northern Connecticut or northern Ohio that Connecticut, it had been included in the original 1662 charter. Mm. When Connecticut joined the other states in giving up its western lands to the new United States to pay, they gave up this land with the proviso that the states would not be responsible for the war debt from the revolution. The national government would take it on. So you give us your land out west, we'll take on the debt, we'll call it even. Connecticut said, great, but we want to keep a chunk of this land in northern Ohio to give to people who got burned out Mm. when the British came and uh, it, it, we like a know. sanctuary almost, or well, like a, a, but also a place to it's just start. Our, it's where these people, it's where we th- they actually there were two bodas. One is we're going to have land for these young Connecticans mm-hmm. who are being, um, who, who are just being forced out because they can't make a living, but also we are going to spread our New England. Puritan or whatever you'd call it, Puritan Yankee culture, mm-hmm. westward. We're you know we're gonna. This is a missionary movement. We're moving west, and we're gonna we're gonna pack up our values and ship them with them. Hmm. So that's going on. It does not solve the problem of how you're gonna make a living in Connecticut, and that's when people discover that they can use running water and the power of New England's rivers to run, to completely transform their economy Mm. and turn it into a manufacturing society. That, that between 1780, really 1790 and 1860, New England was transformed and Connecticut, you know, right in the thick of it from an agricultural economy to an industrial society and what is fascinating to me is it seems like Orford Parish is anticipating becoming manufactured or becoming Manchester even in the beginning because the cotton mill and the woolen mill and the glass works, mm. those, that's a concentration of early industry in one place that it, it's happening earlier than in most parts of Connecticut. And with the concentration, you don't find in a lot of places. Hmm. Yeah, that's true. It's interesting. And the East Hartford section of or- Orford Pal- Parish had the better land for tobacco or whatever, you know, well, growing. I hope Manchester was able to engross that when they. And yeah, Manchester is like half and half 
uh, you know the seed packets that tell you where the climate, it yeah. goes right down through the center of Manchester. The side where Highland Park is, rocky, colder by five degrees. Mm. Um, the part closer to East Hartford, more temperate and, and better soil being closer to the river. You know, I used to live right out in Highland Park. No one told me it was colder when I moved there, <laughs> but I sure found out. Yeah, it's amazing. But yeah. it, it's a like a microclimate, I guess, as you, you go farther there. But paper, there were paper mills there in the Highland Park section depending on that water to run the machinery, but also to dump out the waste. A lot well, of waste involved with paper That making. became... When I was teaching, one of the things I did was teach a course on the Connecticut River and the story of the pollution of the Connecticut River, mm -hmm. especially as these industries went from small manufactories to industrial complexes. It, it, it was awful. Yeah. The, uh, people didn't, they didn't think. They, you know, th there's... There's a saying that I learned when I started to study environmental history, and it's that the solution to pollution is dilution. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's what people thought for a long time. If you dump your waste in the river, there's so much water. It'll dilute, It'll yeah. take care of itself, not a problem. But mm -hmm. by 1850 and 1860, it's become a big problem all the way along the Connecticut River. In fact, they can no longer drink the Connecticut River water in Hartford. They, they try to do that. They find out it's, you know, it's not. Yeah. It's no longer safe, both because of industrial <coughs> pollution and human waste that's coming down the river. So, and a lot of that pollution is, by the 1880s and 1890s, it's coming out of east of the river yes. from these industrial complexes. Paper there. and and yeah. and fabric textiles. Both they of those are of very high, highly polluting production processes. Yeah. The dye works. You know, there are people who, in my lifetime, talk about growing up along the river where these these either paper mills or fabric mills were. And they would know what they were doing because they'd look and see the color of the water would depend on what they were dyeing that day. Oh, yeah. It, <laughs> and, you know, it, it, what was it? Catherine Hepburn did a film called The, called the Long Tidal River or something in mm. the 1965 where she said the Connecticut is America's most beautiful cesspool. Yeah. <laughs> and and she, she hit the nail on the head then. And we've made amazing progress since 65. Yeah. Uh, Connecticut was the first state to pass a Clean Water Act. Yep. And um, Definitely comes from a history. The, yeah, the water is now swimmable <laughs> all through Connecticut, right. which is pretty amazing. It's a good and turnaround. It's Union <laughs> Pond right out here mm -hmm. from our studio where we are here in Northwest Park yes. was filthy and mm. smelly. And now it's lakefront property, and well, eagles are flying uh, around yeah, Union yeah. Pond. It's yeah. amazing. Well, uh, you know, in a world where you think things are just going off the rails, it's really nice to step back and realize that there are victories and there are good things going Absolutely. on. Absolutely. That's one thing about history that people will say, oh, the good old days. The good old well, you know, women couldn't vote. You mm. couldn't drink the water. Um, children died um if you had a family of eight maybe you had 12 pregnancies and some mm. just didn't survive yeah. to adulthood so looking back at history it was not necessarily the good old days right you know, the, you know they're only good because you look back at them when you're living <laughs> through it's all perspective like, they could be better <laughs> they could be better <laughs> yeah mm. all over connecticut you had between 1790 and 1830 all these bills, these factory villages crop up. But here, you didn't have a single complex creating a village. You already had a concentration of manufacturing that I think helped the General Assembly and helped the people here really think we can be, 
we can be extraordinarily successful as a manufacturing complex. Do you think that's what was driving them? Yeah, yeah. The, the title, Manchester, and its relation to Manchester, England, the um, rise of various industries, too, that was a slightly different pattern. There were two glass works. There was the Mather glass works and the Tipton glass works. We think of the Cheneys. They began in 1838, but there was actually a Jones, Jones silk mill over in the north mm. end of Manchester that started even a little bit earlier. But that was a very touchy business in the beginning with people trying to grow their own silkworms, which only ate the leaves of one of the nine varieties of mulberry trees, oh, wow. which was not um, – this was not a favorable climate for that particular tree. So there was a a lot of um, I guess false you could starts. call it false starts, mm. and um, <coughs> it's always amazing to me. It amazes me that people kept on after like coming to complete failure. The floods, the flood of eighteen sixty nine, the flood of nineteen oh nine, how they went on again <laughs> after. You know, <laughs> one of the the there was a a dissertation written about the Connecticut River maybe in the past 10 years that I found really insightful. It, and what the, the scholar who wrote that dissertation noted that I hadn't thought of is that until you got to the railroad era, people who lived along the river or along rivers expected them to flood. Mm -hmm. That they knew, you know, when spring came, the snow melt from up the Connecticut mm -hmm. River was as likely to produce flooding as not. And they, they built their riverfront shops and factories and stores expecting that when the flood came, they'd get everything up to the second floor, the water would <coughs> come in, and they'd clean it out when the water left. You know, it, we can't imagine that, but that, mm. you know, and they'd, canoe around or boat around from store to store. This was an average, this was business as usual yeah. during this period. But once you get railroads mm. running along the riverbank, now you can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. You've got to have regular time. You can't flood out a railroad and bring it back. And that now you start getting the levees and the need for flood control. Yeah. And this idea that a flood is unnatural, that it's something that we can't live with, he argued comes out of this really the advanced industrial revolution. Mm. I think that's really fascinating. Mm. Yeah, kind of like the controlling of the river. Well, you have to control it once you get these huge investments in transportation mm -hmm. that are, you know, you can't say, okay, the 953 to Manchester, although we're doing it a lot with the airlines these days, mm -hmm. the 953 isn't going to happen because, well, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, um, I didn't write the dissertation, so I didn't do the research, but I found that to be extraordinarily interesting. And it, mm. it has mm. me rethinking what flooding means to various people at various times. When are the, the, the great floods in Manchester happened when? Well, 1869, the only dam that remained was Union Dam, oh, the wow. one that's quite near here. Everything else was um, washed out. Was washed out. Wow. Yeah, it was, you would consider it quite disastrous. But of course, some of those dams weren't like what we consider a dam today. They might be an earthenware, an earthen dam. Uh, or maybe no mortar at all, just some pile. Was that a spring flood? Was it a Connecticut River flood that caused it? Was it in the was I think that was in the fall, that yeah. particular one. Mm. Or it could have been the hurricanes. The, the fall hurricanes, yeah. yeah. Now, speaking of villes, though, I think mm. Manchester, like the New England bills. pattern, we had uh, Lightallville. That was where Lightall full paper mills were. You had Cheneyville, or the, right. where the Cheneys were in the south end, which was not – the most prosperous in the beginning. In the beginning, it was the north end, which was called Union Village, after the Union Cotton Mills. That's where the main line went 
through the railroad oh, line nine months through because the south end um, was not yet cock grown. It right. was still struggling with the... With when did the railroad come to Manchester? That was 1849. 1849. And the so Hartford, Providence, and Fishkill railroads yes. came through. You could go to Boston. You could go to Willimantic. Um, you could go to New York going the other way. And um, it wasn't until 1869 that the South Manchester Railroad was built, that little two-and-a-half-mile spur that's now a rail trail, very mm. popular rail trail. And, oh, and yeah. there's this wonderful person named Susan Barlow who <laughs> leads people <laughs> on on hikes along the old rail trail. Yeah. yeah. It's an amazing, it's amazing that we ever got it back together anyway because it had been all broken up. How, uh, did, how did that come yeah. about? Yeah. It, it's quite a story. The, um, the well, Freight ran along those rails into the 1980s. Yeah, uh, long after Less than a the long time. Uh, after the um, Teenies had left, but they were bringing uh, rolls of newsprint down to the Manchester Herald, sure. which which ride quite well on railroad cars. And there was a conglomerate of uh, businessmen, <coughs> if you want to characterize them not as sharks or pirates but anyway <laughs> they told the town when the property became available from the new haven railroad don't buy that property don't buy that property that's a terrible thing for this the town is in to the buy. 1980s yes oh my goodness <coughs> they bought it themselves and then they tried to sell it back to the town for outrageous amounts of money and then it's parts of it were sold there was an easement to the electric company so it had um electric poles going around it there was along hilliard street there was a business that bought like a three quarters of an acre there so there were different parts of it um south of middle turnpike there are some strip malls there along broad street um the moriarty brothers area uh. or uh, shop right i'm not shop right save more so it had been so how did it get repackaged so that it all came back together it's again. a miracle one of the owners um passed away and his sons said this needs to come back together mm. and wow. sold for fifty five thousand dollars which the father had been trying to sell for yeah. unconscionable amounts of money to the manchester land trust from all the way from the north end to middle turnpike so at, at least a linear mile and then the related acreage around the That's edge of it. And then it took another, I don't know, 12 or 14 years. The town of Manchester gradually put together everything south of Middle Turnpike. So now you can, g you can follow the entire railroad again. That's but it amazing. Was, it and is that amazing. Yeah. It's a miracle that it ever came back together. We wondered if it would ever happen in our lifetime. And some of the neighbors, oh, we don't want any rail sure. trail. Um, they had freight trains going through their backyard. Really? Well, well, yeah, well, but originally. then they didn't want hikers. Up until but they didn't want 1980, that. correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. For a long they didn't time, want yeah. hikers. <laughs> but that's n that's a pattern too, isn't it? Yeah. Throughout New England, uh, a lot of towns had a very difficult time getting rail trails put back together because mm. neighbors were fearful of what sure. would happen. Well, maybe it's going to be know, motorcycles if, if going there. If the train's there. going through, it keeps going. If somebody's walking through, you never know what they're going to exactly. do. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. That's, yeah, I'm amazing. <laughs> well, why don't we talk about that the, the railroads a little bit? Because I know that you've got a lot, of, a lot of history and a lot of knowledge with that. It's interesting that the Cheney Railroad, well, the Cheneys weren't prospering in 1849, not to the extent that they did in later decades. Mm. So... That's why the main line went where the major industry went where was. Where the business <laughs> was, sure. And mm. by the late 1850s, when the Cheneys began to prosper, they went to the to the main line and said, mm. "Well, build us a little spur," which they did in Rockville. There's all little spurs sure. throughout um, the towns that are served by the railroad, but mm. they were turned <coughs> down, and um, the Cheneys just opened up their own pocketbook and built this two and a half mile railroad which is actually when you add in the railroad yard and the siding and yeah. the uh, the roundhouse and all it was more than two and a half miles of track 
Hmm. And so it, where was the roundhouse for the cheese? For that was over near the mill, yeah. on um, south of the Park Street Bridge. Not much. You can hardly see any remains yeah. of it yeah. today. But there were all throughout the railroad yards. There were coal storage buildings, and yeah. uh, there was a shop where you could sign in where packages that were going in and out. Um, and what happened to all those facilities? Did they just decay, and or were they? Mostly they decayed. I think there was a little arson here and there, some vandalism, mm. but they were not. That's called insurance. <laughs> 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 they were not built for the ages either. They were more, I think you'd characterize them more as shacks than, yeah. uh, than office buildings. But an interesting thing about the Cheney Railroad is that, of course, it was bringing in raw goods. They were buying their raw silk in the Orient, oh, in okay. Asia. After this fiasco of trying to grow our own silk, I was going to say, is that why? And then they yeah. were shipping out finished goods, yeah. but it was also a passenger railroad. Right. The no trolleys yet, no buses, True. no cars, and very few people owned a horse and carriage. Those were just the rich people. They would they would take that railroad for church even, wouldn't they? Was that was that you so could good? go, yeah. So. Original, the original Catholic church in Manchester, St. Bridget's, mm -hmm. was in the north end. This was before St. James was built in the yeah. south end. So if you wanted to um, work at Cheney Brothers and you lived in the south end, let's say, mm -hmm. you could go to church in the north end. Or you live in the north end and you want to go to the theater, the Cheney Hall, mm -hmm. you, you could take the train. So what were the fares like on the train? They were un the like four cents. Yeah. Unbelievable, <laughs> you know? That was the. Was Can you see the, the picture of the? Yeah, we'll the definitely for anybody for anybody to. watching. We'll definitely get a, a copy of that and put it on the video. Yeah, yeah so you that's a great. You idea. could take your. Can you describe what we're looking at? So this is a passenger car. I know the windows are a little bit broken, but um, it wasn't like a trolley, which were often open air. Mm. This was yep. like a little. Like a little house that yeah. rolled along. Like if we think of now, the were, were the tracks the same width as yes. the Fishkill, yes. same gauge? Yeah, they were standard gauge. So you could, if you were bringing in businessmen from New York or Boston, you could send your car from the Cheney Mills up to the main line, mm. the depot in the North End, switch it, yep. drive out to New York, and bring people in oh. people came in for it's like the company it's like the company plane right like you the company your railroad plane. Car. <laughs> very similar to the company plane uh as time went on of course trolleys and cars became more popular and uh by 1833 the railroad was no longer a passenger railroad yeah. it was 1933 just a 1933 yeah. sorry yeah 1933 um but by then so much has happened with industry, mm. not just Manchester, but Connecticut, the Great Depression, mm. the um, the poverty, the I can't, um, it just went on and on. I, I've interviewed folks who were going to school during the Depression or who were just starting their career as the Depression, in the middle of the Depression, mm. and they, s they often say, we thought it would never end. We yeah. thought this was life. Yeah. This was life that people were going to be struggling yeah. and not being able to find a job. It yeah. must have been such a transition for Manchester because it had been, it had been growing at such a pace a and recruiting workers from Europe to come to Manchester yeah. and work in the Cheney Mills work yeah. to help, help create these goods. And then suddenly it all dries up. Yeah, yeah. there was such prosperity. Uh, you look back to 1923, the hundredth anniversary of the town, and there are just huge parades and concerts, and all the buildings had bunting on them. Yeah. And people were it just there was so much money. Manchester supported all kinds of arts, mm. uh, theater and music mm. and painters, uh, parks, and then 1929, and then it just went on and on. Who did, in, in these golden days of Manchester, who did Manchester see as its competitor cities or towns? Were they, you know, when they would have a celebration, they would say, boy, 
those people in you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Windsor, those yeah, people yeah. in Hartford, we'll <laughs> show them. Ooh. Well, actually, we kind of consider ourselves the Silk Town or the Silk City. Patterson, New Jersey, actually calls itself the Silk Town, mm. the Silk City, and they were they were quite the competitor, but they were not quite as soup to nuts as we were. We had a box factory. The Sheenies made their own boxes to ship stuff out. So a little bit more um, expansive mm. and uh, horizontal, if you will, as well as vertical, and selling throughout the world. They had an office. They had offices all around the country and in Paris. So, but yeah, they would consider other towns, maybe Patterson, New Jersey. Um, they so, so it was a competitor city rather than adjacent cities. I would say. We don't yeah. have to show up Hartford, but by <laughs> no. golly, are close in Patterson. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, one of the, one of the things that, my, that the research I've done on Manchester suggested to me, and, and most of this came out of my understanding of how the Cheney Mills work, is that Manchester really did have a kind of, people would say this pejoratively now, they'd, they'd call it a paternalistic factory system. Mm. The, the idea, the idea that the factory owners have a kind of a parental obligation, mm. not parental, but that, that they, they need to treat their employees well. They need to you know, provide good housing, that the pay's got to be decent, that this really is, if you work at the Cheney Mills, you're part of an industrial family. That doesn't mean that, you know, it's the same kind of family that <laughs> you have in your domestic nuclear family. But there is an obligation to treat people well and that compared to some of the sweatshop industries that happen in other places, that just didn't seem to happen in Manchester. Is that a fantasy of mine? No, or no, no, yeah. Uh, not a fantasy at all. The competition really helped the employees that you could go from working at Cheney Mills, you could go to Hilliard Mills, that you could, or Patterson, New Jersey, for that matter, if you were a skilled artisan. And but then you'd have to pick up the accent, you know, oh. it sound like you're from oh. New Jersey. <laughs> 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 yeah, they'd call you a Yankee for sure, wouldn't yeah. they? But um, the, the different businesses had to provide more for the employees. So it was they a competitive labor market. So it was very competitive. It was never a company store. Hilliard Mills had to have company housing. You could rent or rent to own. Um, Bonnie and I, <coughs> which is over at the other end of Hilliard Street, the soap and uh, scouring powder uh, factory, they had company housing. It wasn't as nice as Cheney. Case Brothers up in the Highland Park area, they had company housing, mm. and it was very commodious. I, I've interviewed people who lived in the very, mm. you know, accommodating houses. And one of the recruiting brochures from Cheney's would say, oh, and you'll have a backyard, and you can have your little garden, mm. which was true. Some of those towns in eastern Connecticut, uh, or I'm thinking up in Lowell even, where the housing was more like barracks. You could yeah. open your door and you'd be on the sidewalk. Oh, wow. These were maybe not a single family house, maybe it was a duplex or maybe it was a three family house, yeah. but you had a yard. You know, if you go up the river, even to a place like Holyoke or Chicopee and you see the factory housing, it's very dense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the I don't know what the conditions for workers were, but I know it just physically it looks like people are packed together in ways. Mm. In Manchester, you really have streets and houses, and you know that that fabric is still largely present yes. in the community. Over yeah. seven hundred of the Cheney Mill units are still <laughs> housing for That's people amazing. today. Wow. It really is a amazing. lot of the Hilliard Mill house. And I grew up in the North End. We used to have to go past 
to Hilliard Mills to get to Hartford. And they were more like hovelers, I would say, yeah. and just kind of um, more to say we have company housing. And the other houses, say, in the Bon Ami area, were, they're still standing. They're still in use today. Mm. But you provided, we provided the housing. You um, helped out the church. And if the church didn't have, a, if it was just getting started, you didn't have a building yet, maybe you let them meet in your yeah. um, your office building or, in, or the Cheney Hall. So what happened, you know, when you get into as early as the 1880s and certainly after World War One, you start getting labor strikes all over Connecticut. Mm. Was there a big strike movement in Manchester? Well, it was spotty. I would say it was more spotty. They did they did go out on strike in at the Cheney Mills. This would be in 1905 era, and a lot of it had to do with. Um, remember cheaper by the dozen <coughs> when they had the 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 people who were going to tell you how to do your job because you could do it better. They yeah. were uh, and they oh, were the efficiency experts. The efficiency yeah. experts and they Taylorism. Would yeah, Taylorism. <laughs> they would come in and say, "Well, you know, you could really run two of these looms. Yeah. You could run two of these looms." And oh, we're not going to run two looms. We're you're just trying to ruin our lives because a lot of it was piecework. You got paid yeah. your salary or your your hourly rate, and then for extra work, there was a a way to get paid piecework so you could make more money. And they would be very suspicious of these time and, you know, the guys with the clipboards. Yeah, the time and, and efficiency. Yeah, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that was the cause of That's one of the strikes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, at the Hilliard Mills, this would be a little bit later, and it, we're getting into the Depression, and they called it s more like slacking. You know, rather than getting laid off, if they didn't have the contract to produce mm -hmm. so many um, – uh, so much wool fabric, they would tell you, well, you're going to work 20 hours this week instead of uh, 45, So, and you got paid by the hour, so you weren't getting paid as much money. And they said, we're not going to do this. We're going out on strike in the Hilly You know, Mills. it's very interesting that the, it, in Germany, the economy is structured so that even now when there's a recession, they sort of redistribute hours among factory workers because the idea is we, we've got to share the burden together. Mm. Certainly not, you know, that's not that's not the way it commonly works in this country. It's like we, when jobs get, when the work slows down, people get laid off mm. rather than. It was uh, a different model, yeah. I would say, because you could kind of predict those. Certain, yeah. certain contracts, you know, might come at certain times. You have and any business, your ups and down times. But when the depression came, it was just <laughs> down. Yeah, they did well, try that to distribute the work. Yeah, that it just goes from bad to worse mm. to even worse to still more worse. Still <laughs> more worse. <laughs> yeah, people died in this country of starvation. Oh yeah. During the depression, it's really frightening. Uh, until we had FDR, uh, some of those programs. But Manchester survived. It changed. It changed. Mm. The war, unfortunately, I have to say, <laughs> World War II, we had our um, Pioneer Parachute. That was a huge industry during mm. World War II. Now, was that a subsidiary <coughs> of Cheney Mills? Because it, they're doing silk, right? It did start out yeah. as a part of um, Cheney Mills and, and in a Cheney Mills building yeah. um, and starting out with silk. But, of course, as time went on, they couldn't get silk from Japan and moved into nylon, which was a diff yeah. all different. Uh, an engineer of engineer who understood the difference between the pull and the air of nylon versus silk, it's fascinating. The whole structure of... The of aerodynamics of nylon versus yeah. silk fabric. Yeah. yeah. And I guess if you're making parachutes, that's pretty important. It's it's scary. <laughs> that's vital. That's Ar vital. Arguably most important. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's then we fascinating. It is. It is. And now we get a little farther in past World War II, and you've got the insurance industry in mm. Hartford that it seemed like a huge percentage of Manchester people were making this commute into Hartford 
to work at Mother Etna mm. or the Travelers or Connecticut General, kind of becoming a bedroom town, if you know, you it's will. really interesting to, to think just the way the railroad facilitated the growth of the industries in Manchester right. because now you could get on a straight line, you could get from the river, which that's where steamboats were how goods traveled until you got to the railroad. Mm. But once you got the railroads, you could take two, you could take a ribbon of steel and a steam engine and metal wheels and go anywhere. You didn't need the rivers to determine mm. where you mm. would travel. So that made the rise of Manchester, it facilitated that, the, having these railroads, the ability to move goods that way. Mm. So I am wondering, and I'm kind of assuming, that it is transportation. It's kind of the interstates and the roads into and out of Hartford. This, the highway transportation that now facilitates the former, the children and grandchildren of the mill workers now becoming the insurance workers in Hartford, right? Mm. Because they can. Right, yeah. except that now in the past 15 to 20 years, the insurance industry has become so strange. It isn't Mother Aetna anymore. It's not a job for life. Aetna is bought by CBS. CBS? Yeah. How can that be? Yeah. And um, I think Mass Mutual, after they took over Connecticut Mutual, that even moved out of state. Things that we thought would never would mm. never leave well, here. It's interesting that you would say that. I was reading this morning it was because it, this is a current deep interest of mine is the what artificial intelligence is going to do to the world we're living in. And I read an article early this morning that this company OpenAI who has who has led the way in this recent rollout of artificial intelligence is saying that eighty percent of our jobs will be transformed by artificial intelligence and that the biggest industry that one of the biggest industries to be changed is going to be the insurance industry because these th they call them generative artificial intelligence programs can actually do the thinking and replace the work of people working in the field right now it's it's amazing mm. and it's also disturbing mm. but i think manchester was the first place that started that no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah just, just trying to circle that thought back around <laughs> yeah well i you know the thing is if people just as people thought oh uh, you know cheney mills are here forever yes, right yes. right mm -hmm. If there's anything that history teaches us, mm. and Manchester is an example, mm. is that nothing lasts Nothing's forever. forever. That whatever, yeah. you know, the place, the place is always the place. Mm. Manchester will last for, hopefully, for thousands of years. Mm. But how the people of Manchester make their way in the world, make their living, mm -hmm. and what their lives are like, that's going to continue to transform decade after decade, and one of the wonderful things about being able to sit and talk about mm -hmm. these transitions is you, you see it as a both a natural evolution that's filled with complete surprises. Right. Mm. So, and so unpredictable. And yeah. sharing these stories, you know, have, again with the conversation – how 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 gone is it that you know how how it's still we're still talking about it we're still able to learn about it and i think that that you know it, is it is it still you know are the mills still act yeah, no but they they're not gone from our memory they're not gone from our history and these conversations that storytelling keeps the keeps all of that alive well and keeps the, that going. they're not gone from our architecture they're not right. gone from the landscape people are now living in the places where their grandparents and great grandparents may have gone to work, and right. now it's their homes, and this is, you know, this is adaptive reuse, mm. and the, mm. the, 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 the 
lessons of history say that you really you do build your future on the past no yeah. matter how transformative mm. it is mm. the, it it it's rare that you just have these complete transformational inventions they always are adaptations of something that came right. before sometimes dramatic right. sometimes not yeah. and it affects the character of the town we have Manchester, <coughs> Ted Cummings, the late um, head of the Democratic Party in Manchester and a World War II veteran, used to say, well, Manchester is a $50 town. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we're not Glastonbury. Glastonbury has – a. we're not West Hartford. Mm-hmm. We're not Avon. Mm-hmm. We're not Simsbury. We're not East Hartford. And we're not Patterson. And we're not Patterson. <laughs> <laughs> Those low life <laughs> So uh, here's a question. If Manchester is a fifty dollar town, what's Glastonbury? A hundred. Hundred. Mm. Oh, the nerve. <laughs> 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 well he was kidding in a way. But in a way, Manchester has always been a home for um, people immigrants moving here from mm. Europe or Puerto Rico or um, the South. And we've been welcoming. Uh, we've had um, opportunities for, like, parks. Mm. You know, uh, that's another interesting history is parks that used to be private. You had a key to get in, yeah. you hmm. know, uh, to the and park. And this was true in Manchester as well? No, no, I'm thinking of, no. no because by the, the time 1823 came along, the idea of a park was for yeah, the public. public. It was yeah. becoming for the public. but. That was a lot of Frederick Law Olmsted, too, after sure. his seeing that if you're going to all live in these little houses and you're all going to work in these factories, you need, you still need fresh air. You still need the greenery. You mm. still need for the health of the people. Mm. So, yeah, Manchester has a lot of park and rec. We have a lot of schools that, um, and of course, we're kind of getting – that's another thing we're getting away from is – the individual school, Washington, Nathan yep. Hale, we're going to have a big fifth grade academy and a sixth grade academy. And a, so kids from all over town will be mm. going there. So that's that's a difference, too. It's so hard to predict. I'm going to tell one more. Go for it. That I would have – I kind of grew up with you go downtown. You could go over north, but they didn't really have the department stores. Yeah. You could do your grocery yeah. shopping. <coughs> but if you want – Hosiery, haberdashery, you know, they had a hat shop down mm-hmm. there that you would go downtown. Main Street. That was Main Street, mm-hmm. downtown Main Street. And when the parkade was being built, mm-hmm. and it was free parking over there, and, oh, if this is terrible, it's going to be the death of shopping. And Well, downtown has become places of restaurants, and the parkade has died yeah. a, a terrible death. But we're going to have the mall. This is the 1980s. Yeah. And Oh, the malls. And people would drive along 84 and they would go to the mall. And this is great for Manchester, all this taxpayer dollars coming in. And now the mall, what? We're yeah. ordering online. Mm-hmm. So though you can't predict what that history mm. would be, as you were saying, you kind of adapt, you kind of cope. And the character of the town somehow kind well, of remains the same. It's it, is, it is interesting to me that this – city that from the beginning had these aspirations for industrial greatness enough that they named themselves manchester after the great english industrial you know the the english city that symbolized the industrial revolution now calls itself the city with village charm and kind of rightfully (laughs) so Mm. that's almost an adaptation too yeah that along the way, it, the people of Manchester realized, maybe in the 20th century, that the, the heart of Manchester is no longer its industrial power, but the fact that in becoming an industrial power, they created a really livable, welcoming city mm. that does have yeah. village charm. Mm. It's maybe because of its factory villages. <laughs> it's factory villages. The town center, the church with yeah. its steep wall. Uh, the East Center Street has a green that goes along it. And the 
Uh, Manchester Garden Club is out there putting in mm-hmm. some new mm-hmm. geraniums. It, it has a sense of village charm. Yeah. And even out in cold Highland Park. No. <laughs> <laughs> we, we had <laughs> Case Mountain. <laughs> and a lot of, well, there's industry and community again. They created the bridge dam. They created the walls, the stairs, the carriage path mm-hmm. that goes around and opened it up to the public and welcomed people to come yeah. there. And that still remains today. Yeah. That could have gone that could have gone in Lots other directions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, quite a few acres there were bought by after the Case family sold out uh, to Boise Cascade. Um, housing development for it could have been housing development all the way to Highland yep. Park Market. Yep. But fortunately, and that's that's why I say Manchester still retains that charm, that village charm, mm-hmm. because people stand up for let's not pave, right. <laughs> let's not let's not build houses there. Um, there was an effort at one time to build condos on the Great Lawn, mm-hmm. and where the mansions are. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, one of the homeowners was going to develop these condos, build a, a nice road right through the middle so you could go up to Forest Street. And um, it, it just, the people rose up against it. Yeah. Um, and so there there is a retention. Some things are lost. We did have urban redevelopment in the sure. North End where all the old buildings were torn down. They're going to get rid of poverty. That's yes. how they're going to, yeah. Well, that's been the yeah that the effort to get rid of poverty has been the source of so many unintended consequences. Yeah, it's just and it's good intentions. Yes, and poor results, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I think we we've, we've definitely had a good <laughs> time for that. You guys have been absolutely outstanding. Honestly, thank you so much. It's, well, it's uh, you know I love Ryan. Having this chance to sit with Susan, I know, and <laughs> talk about the history of this place because I have, you know, I have a perspective. I lived in Manchester for, uh, gosh, about seven or eight years, mm-hmm. so I feel a, a real connection to Manchester. But my knowledge of it doesn't begin to approach <laughs> her, so I feel like I'm getting the real skinny. I know, me too. Right. Yeah, I feel the same way. I don't. And Susan, yes, tell us what you <laughs> tell us. So Susan is 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 Manchester's historian, and she for the bicentennial has put together. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, this was twenty three walks for two thousand twenty three, <laughs> and I came up with twenty three walks. If you go to at least ten, you're, I have a rubber stamp, a bicentennial rubber stamp. Mm-hmm. If you go to at least 10, you might qualify to win a bicentennial coin. Ooh, okay. But, of course, the main thing is to come on the different walks, the railroad, a couple of railroad Mm. walks, one from the north end to Center Springs Park, one from the south end. Uh, This past Saturday, we went to Hollywood, uh, housing development by E.J. Hall, Mm H-O-L-L, Hollywood. (laughs) That's Scarborough, Lancaster, Wellington, Winchester. Cromwell, little streets, um, the 1920s yeah. development. So, so invite all our podcast our listeners podcast to listeners, come. Yes. This is available at town libraries, the town hall, and the Manchester so History Center. So it's a description of all the walks, and you can yeah. also it's like your passport book. You it's can your get passport it book. Yeah. And the town of Manchester Historical Society. There's also a website, correct? Yes, you can you can get this online. And what, what website is is that? Manchesterhistory.org. Perfect. And if you go to the events page, it'll there'll be a link you can click, and it. Fantastic. Oh, this is so yeah. exciting to see, to to see. We are recording this on the second day of spring. Yeah. And this is you know this is as good as a robin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If there wasn't a sign that spring's here. Yeah. Right? We go to a lot of the Vills. We oh, go to cool. Woodbridge, uh, the the Manchester Green. We go to Buckland. We go to these different yeah. areas of town. We could actually probably do fifty three. We could there would sure. Be, there's always something so interesting. Now, do you lead all these walks? So, do you? Is there a website with the schedule of when you do them, or is it in the booklet? Or it's in the booklet. Yeah. 
And I'm sure we could get you a booklet before you leave. Yeah, I would love to. Here. Oh. There you go. You're oh, hereby invited. <laughs> you still have time to get the coin. But I have to point out, it's not not gold. It's not <laughs> It'll be gold. But it is very It'll special. I have you. seen it. I have it is seen pretty. it. It is it's very nice. beautiful. Yeah. It's a very special coin. And Walter, you are. What are you up to currently? Are don't you do a, a podcast as well? I do. I I with Connecticut Explored Magazine. I do a podcast called Braiding the Nutmeg, and I'm hopeful that this podcast will actually be one of the Grading the Nutmeg podcasts. It's so interesting. Absolutely, yeah. To, we'd love to share to, that with you. Yeah, we'll, yes. we'll do this as a collaboration. And um, How can know, anybody find that? Do they just look as, as on Spotify and it, Apple Music and all yeah, that it's stuff? Yeah, it, it's on all of them. Perfect. And, um, yeah, you can search for grading the nut grading the nutmeg it's yeah. such a it's such a strange name <laughs> it's, it's a perfect name. not a lot of competition <laughs> <laughs> not too many nutmeg po- yeah, t- podcasts right. out there yeah. yeah yeah well that's fantastic so thank you both again for being here i'm so excited I, you the conversation has been so interesting i know i didn't do a lot of talking but <laughs> i'm happy about but that it, listen, it was, it's been great susan you're a yeah. star oh. it, manchester oh. <laughs> is incredible Incredibly fortunate that you have given so much of your life to the history yes, we of are. this town. Yes, we are. Thank you. It, you know, I, as a historian, I appreciate how invaluable the knowledge someone like you acquires over the years is, and um, I, I, I want you to know how much the people of <coughs> Connecticut appreciate you. And um, you're, do, you're doing God's work. Thank, well, thank you. you very much, Walter. That means a lot. It's Thanks. true. It's true. Well, I'm, <laughs> and I'm appreciative of both of you for being here and for just sharing your knowledge with everybody because I think that that's kind of the point of all this is to is to share it with everybody as much as we can, get people, you know, let people know what, what has been going on for so long. And, I'm, you know, we're, 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 we're all very lucky to have both of you. So thank mm-hmm. you so much. Well, it's great fun. Thank you. And, yeah. and you have great ring lights. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the lights. I appreciate that, Walt. All right. Well, that's going to do it for us for the Tiny Podcast today. Thank you all for being with us. And we hope to see you on the next episode. Have a good one. Thanks, Walt. Thank you so much, guys. That's that great. was so great.